Rainbow Six Siege is a game about being king of the castle, whether you built it or you took it from someone else. It's a common fantasy, the idea of creating something impenetrable or overcoming something unassailable. In Rainbow Six Siege, sometimes this castle is a military complex or an office space or a civilian house, but the fantasy is the same, and while the bugs and business model around Siege have been doing their best to ensure that I don't enjoy this game, the actual core gameplay makes a solid approximation of this fantasy. Rainbow Six Siege delivers well, but not perfectly, on offering the player the joy of being king of the castle. When defending, you're given the tools to create a mighty fortress, and on the offense, you are given just enough explosives to effectively undermine that fort. This game promises a wide range of destructive options, and my first issue with the game is that it refuses to take that destruction to the nth degree. The simple truth is that not everything in this game comes apart. When I am promised that I can tear apart the entire world, I want to be able to really ruin every single thing, not get told that this wall is indestructible. When I cover a wall in metal, the enemy team can still get through it with a certain specialized equipment. But the wall of this civilian house cannot be altered in any way? I understand, conceits such as this are made for the sake of balance, so that the defenders can focus on choke points. And when I'm on the defensive, I still think it's weird, but I appreciate it. That being said, I want to break everything in this game. And there is no game mode that allows me to break these sacred, balance-protected walls. Not even in the single-player mode, or even in the AI modes where the designers don't need to worry about the fun that's being had by the defenders. I don't think I need to be able to breach clear through every single wall, give them metal frames or something so that I can't walk through, but at least let me shoot. Because I want to interact with every single part, and by interact I mean I want to blow up every single part of this building because it is so incredibly fun to do so in this game. Now I'm going to try and talk about the single player content for this game, but there's not much. Terrorist Hunt is here. It's a player versus AI mode. It's still fun, but it's just a multiplayer mode that happens to be playable in single player and it contains no additional production value compared to a multiplayer match. I happen to think it's a mode that's more fun solo where I don't have to compete with four other dudes for my fair share of goons to bop, but that doesn't really amount to the content of a single player campaign by any means. As far as dedicated single player content goes, there's a measly 11 missions which also serve as the tutorial for learning to play. These 11 missions happen to end with possibly the most intense and interesting piece of content in the game. The last of the situations is a multiplayer versus AI map, with four other players who are presumably new to the game just like you because they're at the end of the situations. You are responding to a chemical weapon attack on a college campus. The game deploys an effect never to be seen again. The air is thick with an unknown chemical that clouds the space with a menacing yellow fog. You can't see further than across a room, and it makes for a thrilling six minute mission, but then it's over. If I could have gotten more missions like that in a single player story, or even a set of multiplayer advanced situations, I want that. But that isn't something that this game provides despite being a full priced product. This mission is the only part of the game I would classify as a campaign. The 10 other situations I would classify as a tutorial for the multiplayer, even if they do have difficulty settings, that's not enough, it doesn't set them apart. So be warned, there's no rad Rainbow Six campaign to be seen here. This game is about the multiplayer, and you should be prepared to lay down $60 for just the multiplayer mode. As far as that multiplayer goes, there is a juicy bit of game here. There's a few different modes. You have Hostage Rescue, Control Point, and Search and Destroy, though these all go by different names. These all lead to the same basic structure. To begin, one team sets up inside a building with one or two objectives, while the invading force uses drones to search through that compound to find that objective, which they would otherwise not know the location of. After this brief setup slash recon section, the invading force comes in and tries to seize that objective, whatever it is. Each game mode introduces some meaningful differences into the mix, but nothing that makes any match feel completely other than the next. They cause you to make different tactical decisions, such as altering what character you're going to play. 
For example, in a hostage mission, there's a single hostage, and if either team kills that hostage, they lose. This leads to a bias toward using precision classes, as opposed to, let's say, Fuse, who can launch four grenades at random through a soft surface. Whereas in a control point mission, you can really mess up a room. The same goes for bomb defusal. But what unites these modes is that they're all 5v5, and if you die, you do not respawn until the next round. Although, if you don't get shot in the head, you just go down onto the floor and can be revived once. This creates a dynamic that's similar to Counter-Strike, where each team is guessing where the other is going to strike from, and then responding as the situation develops. At the start of each round, you select an operator to play as each with different special gear that is exclusive to them as a means of balancing the game. Because only one person can play as, let's say, Thermite at a time, when I beef up a wall, I can be relatively certain that I'm safe behind it as long as I know that Thermite is not on the map. And even if Thermite is on the map, he can only destroy two of these reinforcements, allowing them to remain powerful. Similarly, if the offensive team can get eyes on the defenders, they can know what they need to expect. Is there going to be poison gas? Are there going to be laser trip mines? Each operator has their own gear, and it's hard to prepare for that gear if you can't see it coming. This incentivizes scouting and communication so that you can adjust on the fly. Now there's grumblings about the number of maps in this game. I myself grew concerned as well before release. However, they are large maps, with multiple places for the objectives to spawn, multiple directions to assault from, as well as a day-night cycle that affects how you can or cannot see in or out of these buildings. The defenders can be anywhere inside the compound, even if you know the location of the objective. And skilled teams will spread out to catch the aggressors off guard as they enter, then converge back on the site as the enemy digs in their heels. There's enough variety that even 15 hours into the game, I'm still encountering rooms that I have never defended, and I still get lost driving my drone into the buildings. Eventually, these maps will feel small, because there's a limit to the places where objectives can be located, but that feels far off. The drone scouting serves as a good, entertaining means of giving the defensive force time to set up while also giving the invading force something to do that's meaningful. These drones can mark the objective on the map and act as static cameras later on in the match, incentivizing defenders to destroy these drones as they enter. It's a fun little game of medium stakes cat and mouse that serves as a welcome intermission between intense rounds. When a team communicates, this game comes into its own. Given the fact that you can shoot through most interior walls, once the attackers have breached into a compound, meaningful cover becomes much harder to come by. The tools provided don't allow you to make a perfectly fortified position, and the mobility provided by the destruction of the environment often means that the defender's advantage frequently slips into a defender's error as he or she attempts to stick to a fortified but compromised position. This game is one of improvisation, and the defender's advantage is merely setting up the stage. Since each defensive player can only fortify two walls, there typically isn't ever a perfect setup, where no wall is coming down without special penetrating explosives. And even if you really do lock down a room, some attackers carry a wall with them in the form of a ballistic shield, being able to assault through doorways and provide cover for friends with bigger guns. I see people concerned about the state of microtransactions in this game. It's an Ubisoft game, and it does have microtransactions, but I haven't felt compelled to use them. There's an in-game currency called Renowned. It comes from regular play of the game in any game mode and comes fast enough that I don't feel like a booster is necessary. You use Renowned for unlocking operators, upgrading their guns, and unlocking certain skins for those guns, although some skins are pay only. Since there can only be one of each operator in a round, there is also the Recruit, if you're out of operators who has no special ability, but he's the most flexible of the classes and one of the most threatening in a gunfight. Completing the tutorial situations will leave you with a handful of operators, and after 10 hours I had most of the operators I wanted and had started upgrading their guns. The trickle of new operators allowed me to digest how each works at a manageable pace. I think that it's a bit scummy thing to do, trying to convince people to drop some dollars to unlock them all faster, but the effects of it are not entirely bad, because I got an operator every six matches or so. I spent some time with each one of them and understood what each of them did. I would rather have access to all the content in my $60 game from the get-go, but this way of getting characters one at a time stopped me from getting overwhelmed by character option. This is a free-to-play model. 
in a full-priced game. But these systems are not paced like a free-to-play game. You gain access to the content within Siege much faster than any free-to-game would allow you. Yet, I paid for this game. I don't feel like Ubisoft should be trying to pump me for money by dangling content that I already paid for in front of me. Now, before we wrap up, some disappointing bits. This game has its fair share of usability issues that haven't been sorted out. There have been spotty times in matchmaking. Even while the game is in the top 10 games being played on Steam, I have found myself unable to find matches. Or, frustratingly enough, getting error messages either in queue for finding a match, or in the middle of a match being kicked out with an error code, denying me my renowned and meta experience. Also, just don't alt tab in this game, just don't do it, it's not worth it. I have had this cause crashes, I've had it stall me out of matchmaking, I've had it mess up my sound settings. If you plan on playing this game with a friend on Skype, prepare to edit your audio settings every time you enter your first match for the night and every single time you alt tab. Whenever you load into a lobby, get into a party, or alt tab, Rainbow Six Siege will set your mic to open transfer because that's what Skype is using, and it won't even tell you that in the in-game settings. This makes it so that everyone in the game can hear what you're doing and that's annoying for everyone. You have to go to the options, change the transit option, apply, and then turn it back to what you want, and that fixes it. But why does it have to be this way? I don't think there's been a patch for this game thus far. I have some smaller gripes about the interface as well. Once you're in a lobby, you can't do much but wait. You can't buy operators, you can't upgrade their guns, you can't change their loadouts. You also can't alt-tab to avoid watching the unskippable intro videos for the game. Thanks. For $60, this game is a bit of a reach. It is something that I would recommend to the tactical multiplayer gamer for $40 easily. But by the time this game hits that price point, it might not be played much anymore, and thus it might not be worth your time. It's a fine multiplayer shooter. It's slower than most, it's more tactical than most, and it demands a bit more cooperation, but it's more satisfying to pull off a plan in this than almost any other shooter I can think of. It gives you the tools for destruction, and using those tools is extremely enjoyable. But there's no single player campaign, so unless you're going at this with a buddy, I would suggest you take your $60 somewhere else.